Uh, can I talk with you um, about leadership? And I would like to talk with you um, and together look at uh, a wonderful passage in the New Testament. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, many, if not all of you here, are leaders of one sort or another. Uh, for, just help me out here. What are the sorts of things you have led in the past or you're leading at the moment? Uh, come on. An extrovert, just come on. Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. Who? Small groups, okay. Just wave a hand if you're doing small groups. Just, oh, wonderful. Great. Fantastic. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, it's no need to get carried away. Um, uh, what other things? What about alpha groups? Wave a hand. Yeah. Women's drop in, did you say? Brilliant. Um, there was somebody who was leading an arts group. So didn't, didn't you speak earlier? Yes, there you go. What other things are you leaving? Students? Yeah, great. Worship. Uh, how many of you are involved in leading worship or leading worship bands and teams? Great. Uh, what about uh, young people, youth or... Um... There you go, look at them. Wonderful. Students involved, I had a supper tonight with somebody who's a leading the student union or involved in the leadership of students. Great, there's some more at the back. What have I missed out? What are you leading that hasn't been mentioned? Yeah, who? <laughs> Transformation, thank you. What about lifestyle? Somebody was doing lifestyle. Yes, there we go. Brilliant. Sorry, you said... You lead a business. How many of you, how many of you here um, have in your normal, normal lives have people who you employ or who report to you? Just stick up a hand. Whether it's inside the church or not, I don't care. Great. Have I missed anybody out? Yes. There you go. So chairing um, a committee, would you have a team around you? There you go. Great. Anything else have I missed out? What age group? What about anything amongst those who are at the elder end of the spectrum? Mission team. Mission team. Where to? Where do you do mission? You go out to the clubs. Excellent. In Vienna or here? Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Have you discovered that leading is wonderful and sometimes hair-raising? Um, le leadership, one of my favorite definitions of leadership is influence. I mean, we don't get to boss people around. Well, we'll come on to that in a minute. But leadership is about influence. Um, and it's about being yourself. Eleanor, what is that thing you're, you're often saying? You may have quoted it earlier. Be yourself, everyone be, else yes. is taken. Be yourself, everyone else is taken. And, and the idea of, you know, that sometimes there are people involved in leadership who feel a bit intimidated because they look at someone else who's leading, maybe usually someone with a little more experience, and they compare themselves and they compare themselves unfavorably. And there may be, and the only reason I mention that is there may be here people sitting literally in this room now. You're thinking, well, I, okay, on paper I'm a leader. You know, I lead this or that, but I don't, I don't really feel much of a leader, and I'm, I sort of feel I don't quite belong in this room because, you know, there are people here, there's Jack and Taryn, you know, and others, and, you know, I just don't sort of. So may I, I have a word for you? And that is, oh, shut up. <laughs> All right? Um, the truth is you're here. The truth is you're here, as Eleanor was reminding us this morning, because we believe, at least, never mind, I don't care about you, but we believe you're here because God has brought you here. 
and you're either leading or you may be between leading jobs. <laughs> you, you, you may aspire to, leader. You're, to lead. You're, you're ambitious. You say, ooh, 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 that makes you go very wobbly because you think, oh, the ambition's a dirty word. You mustn't be ambitious. No, 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 you, you've misunderstood. It's perfectly okay to be ambitious. The, the Bible talks about godly ambition and ungodly ambition. Now, most of us as good, you know, good little Christians, we're all terrified of ungodly ambition. And that, therefore, sometimes makes us a bit backward in coming forward. Do you know what I mean? Because we're so frightened of my, my motives, you know. Are my motives pure? I would hate... I, I, do you know, my advice to you is forget about motives. Just don't even bother with it. Because the truth is our motives are never 100% pure because we're human beings. That's just the way it is. So get on and be ambitious. And God, God has a way, honestly. He, 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 but the, if there's ungodly ambition creeping into your godly ambition, then he, believe me, he can deal with that. I promise you. I mean, all you've got to do is to pray, Lord, what's wrong with me? So pray, he loves to answer. <laughs> do you know? Uh, and for, for most of us, I mean, people sometimes occasionally say to me, you know, you've, um, you're particularly your wife, you know, you're very, your wife is very successful and very good at doing all this and that, and she is, and, you know, you're not bad yourself, sort of thing. And um, how is it you stay humble with the success God has given you, if that's the right word? To which my answer is it's very, very simple. Just God sends me enough failure and disappointment, and setbacks, and heartbreaks. You know, there's, nothing, honestly, there's nothing to get proud about, honestly. So uh, all I'm trying to say to you, by the way, and this is just the preamble, this is like a golfer. You know, you say someone at a tee, and, and they woggle. They will, do you know how they woggle? And then they pick up that little stick thing. And Well, in this part of the world, of course you know all about this. They pick up that little, what do you call that sprouty stick thing? Tea, there you go. And, they, you know, they pick it up and they put it down again and they pick up a leaf and watch the wind direction, you know, then they put it up, then they pick the ball up again and polish it and they put it down. And they, you know, all this sort of waggling, that's all I'm doing now. I'm just waggling at, at the tea. <laughs> but I want you to know, I want you to know that what I'm trying to do is lower the, lower the bar. Think high jump. Yes? Do you know what I mean by, do they do that in Vienna, Austria? You know, two <laughs> vertical poles, yes, with a, with a bar across the top. And the idea, at any certain height, you've got to get your body over that bar. They don't care how, as long as you don't cheat. You, you, know, you can't use rope. You've just got to get, haul yourself over without, but without knocking the bar off. And if you do knock it off, you have a second go. Yes? And I was very good at it, age... 11. I was, you would, I was a ch school champion high jumper. You didn't know that. That's, you'll look at me in your eyes now. Um, all I'm trying to do is to keep the bar on this leadership thing. I want to keep the bar very low. Because people get intimidated, or the, the whole term and the sort of ethos. No, 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 no. What is a leader? A leader is someone who has a following. That's my definition of leadership. So just look over your shoulder, and is anybody following you? I don't care. You can give yourself all the labels in the world, but if you look over your shoulder, nobody's following you. you, you whatever you are, you're not a leader. <coughs> On the other hand, if you know, you've been a Christian for about 30 minutes, I exaggerate, 40 minutes, and you look over your shoulder and there are a couple of other students in your hall of residence who want to talk with you about Jesus. And they're being so persistent that in the end you say, well, let's, you know, I'm meant to be doing some revision for exams, so let's meet on Thursday at Starbucks at, you know, midday and we'll have a cup of coffee. And then you can fire your questions. Sure enough, they turn up and they bring a friend. And the three of them sit down with you and talk about Jesus for an hour and they clear off. You're a leader. Do you see, leadership, a leader is somebody who has a following, somebody whom you can love and influence. So don't get too hung up over this whole leadership thing 
and whether or not you are going. The fact that you're here, let's assume, just for the sake of this evening and the next 48 hours, let's pretend you're a leader, all right? Let's act as if. Why don't you act as if you're a leader, all right? And then I'll act as if. And we'll, we'll act together. We'll play the game together, and then, you know, we'll review it on Friday morning. <laughs> all right? So no more sitting there thinking, what am I doing here? I'm not a leader. Shut up. All right? Just play along. And let's have a look at what the scriptures have to say. You'll love it. Uh, if you've got, a, what was it, Eleanor said, a Bible or some sort of digital device, uh, would you like to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5? And um, you can look at your mobile for as long as you promise not to do your emails. Or Sudoku. Because this is more interesting than, even than Sudoku. Uh, 1 Peter 5. Let's start at verse 1. To the elders among you, okay, let's stop there. Um, because I don't want you to get hung up over the language. The word elder it, it, it does have a history of confusing people. And various parts of the body of Christ over the last 2,000 years, and a little bit at the Reformation in particular, you know, got a, there was a bit of a hoo-ha as to how that should it be translated elder, should it be translated presbyter, should it be translated overseer, and it's variously, the answer is from the, the word in the Greek, even in the letter, Peter's first letter, it's translated in different ways. On one occasion it's overseer, on another occasion it's elder. You know, um, I mean, it, as, as I say, the word itself is a, has been a bloody battleground. Uh, at one point in our history, was it the end of the 16th century? This country declared war on England, and do you remember the battle cry? No bishop, no king. So, you know, people have got excited over the use of the word. May I suggest that we don't? Um, <laughs> It's, lapor it's notoriously difficult to define what exactly an elder is or a presbyter or an overseer. It just is difficult. And I personally, my view is that God left the New Testament deliberately vague or ambiguous so that in different times and in different cultures and different eras, there was flexibility in the way that leadership was exercised and in the structures. That's my own view. So um, you needn't get terribly excited is what I'm saying. I, I suppose my preference would be to use the term leader as a description, as, as it were, as an adjective, if I'm allowed to, rather than as a title. It's something we do. And so you're a leader as long as you're leading. You're an elder so long as you're elding. All right? How's that? Let's have another go, another run at the bar. Think high jump. All right, chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Oh, you've got it up on the screen. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. There's another of those dodgy words, but you, you, serving as a leader, okay? To the, to the leaders among you, serve as a, as a leader. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, or the arch shepherd is what the word means, when the chief arch shepherd appears, Jesus, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So, Lord, as we look at this uh, paragraph together from your word, will you speak to us through it? Will you speak to the, my brothers and sisters in this room, whom in one way or another you've called to lead, and may it be that the same Holy Spirit who caused Peter to write this in the first place, may that you, by your same Spirit, come and deposit something in us and in this church this evening. May it be that the, the Scriptures, as it were, 
sing in our hearts, resonate with us. Amen. We had a great friend who had in his uh, sitting room, quite a large room, a grand piano, or at least a baby grand piano. And for some reason, his brother-in-law used to collect antique glass walking sticks. You didn't, I mean, the things that people collect, you didn't realize they did, did you? And uh, this brother-in-law had given to John, my friend, the pianist, had given him two, over the years of Christmas, days, two or three of these very beautiful antique, they were glass, walking sticks. And he would, they were displayed on the flat bit of the grand piano. And every now and then when he would play the piano and play certain chords on the piano, the things would literally, you could hear them, they'd start to zing, they'd start to hum. And a physicist here would tell you what it, what it but there's something to do with the resonance. And the things would hum. And so do you notice, have you noticed sometimes the scriptures are like that? They just zing and hum and resonate. You look at it and you think, goodness me, that, I'm sure that wasn't there the last time I read. You know, somebody shoved it in when I was looking. <laughs> do you know that feeling? And I hope this will strike you as the same. Um, by way of introduction, Peter is reminding us here that not only that God's church is not only God's family but that we are also God's flock and probably it's true to say that the apostle Paul's favorite description of the church is the family and for the body of Christ and maybe Peter's is the favorite is the flock and what was it Ken said so beautifully he uh, said about the flock can you remember he said it this afternoon he's written on my computer which is upstairs in my room even though he betrayed the shepherd, even though he betrayed the shepherd God, God gave him charge over the flock did you notice that yeah. beautiful shepherd and sheep I, I suspect in our culture the word shepherd you know, if, if we're talking now about leadership and we're talking we're using the description or the metaphor of shepherd of what you do I imagine that doesn't ring many bells with you because we're not an agrarian culture and probably in our minds there's a good deal of sentimentality attached uh, to the idea you know it's sort of associated isn't it with baby lambs in the spring gambling on the hillside gamboling on the hillside and skipping carefree across the Yorkshire Dales or the Grampians or wherever you gambol sheep here <laughs> you know and it's all rather twee and you know fluffy white things you know what I mean Whereas you forget, we forget, just how tough a task it was and, and actually how courageous a shepherd in the, in the time that this was written, how, how, how tough and courageous a shepherd needed to be. Um, you remember Psalm 23, the Lord is, no, the pastoral song, the Lord is my shepherd. Do you remember? And verse whatever it is, he talks about your rod and your staff comfort me. Well, David is speaking of a couple of weapons there. You realize that, didn't you? So today it will probably be, you know, your shotgun and your taser gun. They comfort me. Because the eastern shepherd, uh, his job was to protect his herd both from wild animals and from bandits. Yes? So when, and when he speaks of, you know, at the end of the Psalm 23, speaks of leading through the valley of the shadow of death, that's no exaggeration. I mean, that's not a metaphor. That's literal. They were surrounded. They spent their lives surrounded by hostility and danger. So that's a much more accurate way of thinking about shepherd. So when he talks about leadership, uh, and portraying it as, and, and as a metaphor for eldership, leadership. It's not, he's not thinking of a gentle stroll through the park on a sunny Saturday afternoon. 
You know, he's not thinking of that. He's thinking, look, this is a job that needs real strength of character in order to do it faithfully. And uh, I want to look, I want to show you, I think there are particularly four qualities or four characteristics that Peter identifies for us that are required for those who have leadership in a pastoral setting, in a ministry setting, which would include all of us. And by the way, um, when it comes, again, just one further clarification, when I talk about leadership uh, in the context of the church, I don't think it has anything to do with age or gender or cultural background or racial background or socioeconomic background or educational background. God uses all sorts. I mean, look around here. Just look around the room just for a moment. Look around. Go on. You know, look around. You're, you're, you're a motley bunch of leaders. And that's excellent. That's how it should be. Rather than cookie cutters, all, you know, all identical. Isn't it Americans talk about cookie cutters? You know, you know we're, we're meant to be different. That's the, so you say, well, I'm not an extrovert. Well, where in the Bible does it say you've got to be an extrovert to be a leader? You say, I'm an introvert. Great. I'm a man. Hmm. Great. I'm a woman. Mm, great. None of these debar us. Have any been a Christian 20 minutes? Great. Been a Christian 400 years? Great. <laughs> Do you see? I don't have an A-level. Great. I have a PhD. Great. Need I go on? Okay, here are the four. Number one, I want to suggest to you that Peter's first characteristic is, is you need to be able to identify with people. You need to be able to identify with people. Look in verse 1. Uh, you, may not, you may have missed it. I appeal to you as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering. I appeal, so here's Peter. Peter, remember? Not no, nobody else. Peter. Big cheese. A big, you know, a grandee. In the early church. Here's Peter saying to this group of churches in an area, we don't know exactly where it was, it's somewhere in Asia. But well, you can look at chapter 1, it'll tell you. But uh, they were going through a tough time. So here Peter writes to them, he says, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. So rather than speaking down to them, he's saying, we're, we're equals, we're colleagues, we're on the, 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 the playing field here is level. No, the, my point is, I think there's enormous graciousness in this phrase. Because, of course, Peter says, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. He was a fellow elder, but he was much, much more than that, wasn't he? I mean, he was an apostle. Specially appointed by Christ to an, as one of the inspired leaders of the beginning of this thing, this wonderful thing we call the church. So, my point is, he doesn't pull rank on them. But he identifies with them, with the leaders of the church he's addressing. Now, I'm an elder too. I'm one, you know, we're, we're in this thing together. Indeed, he doesn't just identify with their tasks. He also identifies with their hardships. They were, as you know, they were going through a very difficult time, probably, as it were, in the front line of anti Christian, certainly anti Christian sympathies, possibly even persecution. And he says, I'm not only a fellow elder, I'm a witness of Christ's sufferings. Now, some commentators take that to be a reference to the fact he was present at Jesus' crucifixion, which is a perfectly legitimate interpretation. However, I suspect when he speaks of Christ's sufferings, he's referring not just to the cross, but to the ongoing agonies which Christ experiences through his body, the church, when it suffers. And in fact, he's citing himself as an example of that attitude he's already commended. Look, he says, I've been experiencing the same troubles as you have. My life, my own life, is evidence of Christ's sufferings. 
I'm a witness of his sufferings, and I'm a, so I'm a fellow saint, a fellow believer, a fellow elder with you, a fellow sufferer. I understand your situation. And it's, it's, it's very, isn't it encouraging when you, when you, uh, you have a conversation maybe with another leader and you think you're the only one going through what you're going through? And then you find yourself talking to them, and sure enough, if they're not going through it now, they've been through it ten times before. And they've got the scars to show it. They've only got to you know, lift their shirt and show you the scars on their chest. How do you think, oh, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not, there's nothing quite so wrong with it as I thought, if this is not uncommon. This happens to other people. Jean-Pierre de Cousseau, writing in the 18th century, all that happens to me becomes bread for nourishment, soap to cleanse me, fire to purify me, a chisel to carve heavenly features upon me. Do you like that? I like that last phrase. I mean, all the difficulties I go through and the suffering, the disappointment and the setbacks is merely God's chisel to carve his heavenly features upon me. Well, that puts a slightly different shift on it, a slightly different perspective, doesn't it? So here is Peter. He's addressing them not as some aloof general from HQ somewhere, speaking down to them and patronizing them or rebuking them for whatever they weren't doing. Instead, no, no, we have Peter identifying them, be able to identify with people. That's the first thing. Second thing. Click. There we go. Be Peter suggests that leaders need to be ready to accept responsibility. You'll love this. Be ready to accept responsibility as a leader. Not something that is overwhelmingly burdensome. It's going to crush you, isn't it? But nevertheless, verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Notice that phrase, God's flock, will you? And underline it. The most that God, as leaders, the most that God ever does with us is entrust leader people to us. So they never ever belong to us. They're God's flock. It's not our flock my flock. You occasionally hear people referring, church leaders referring to their congregation as my church. And I know what they mean, they're just short, shorthand. But don't ever let that attitude settle in so that the people in your small group are yours. They belong to you. And woe betide anybody who comes anywhere near to pinch anybody. You know, pinch my worship leader. How dare you, he's mine. As you reach out to stab them. No, no, and we laugh at it, and I'm gooning around, but the truth is, uh, we do sometimes, leaders sometimes get insecure and preparatorial. They, they hold the people close to themselves. It's not long before you'll go and plant a church somewhere, in, somewhere in Scotland, and you'll get flack from the churches that are already existing there in that town or city. Because they feel that not even if you've even arrived yet and started nicking their people, you haven't had a chance to start. But nevertheless, they're threatened by you. Because the instinct, the inst it's, it's, they belong to me. They don't. They all belong to God. And which particular group he puts them in, which part of the body of Christ, at least I'm, I listened to Ellen this one, did you? About election and God's sovereignty and God's choosing. So God puts people in families and in church groups. He's sovereign, he does that. And if he gives them to you for a time, entrusts them to you, for, and then moves them somewhere else, who are you to whinge and whine? Who am I to? I want to. I think it's a daft idea to send so-and-so off to plant a church. I've done that many times. I'd much rather keep them. Because I've invested time and money. And goodness me, I've been nice to them all these years. <laughs> you know, I've tried to butter them up. God's flock. I love this. Bernard of Clairvaux, in one of his sermons, asked his congregation, suppose you had a vessel, cup, bowl, 
with some of, in it, containing some of the blood that Christ shed on the cross in this bowl. He says, how carefully you carry it. Hmm? Ought I not, he goes on, ought I not, therefore, to be careful of those souls for whom that blood was shed? God's flock is so precious to God that he sent the, the price tag was his son's blood at Calvary. Now, if that's how precious the flock are to God, how much should I respect that and copy it as an attitude? It's a very powerful argument. It's a very powerful argument. My point is it's impossible to underestimate the value of the church so far as God is concerned. It's impossible. And what a privilege that God allows us to lead. He, he entrusts us to these people. I guess God says, I'll just, it's a bit like your, if you're any of your parents here, and particularly parents of children who've now, you know, as it were, fled the nest. The truth is they're entrusted to you for what seems like when they're two and screaming at five in the morning, it, it feels like, you know, this is a, a century that you got them for. The truth is it's only, what, about, in our culture, about 20 years. God entrusts them to you, and then he moves them on. And it's the same in the body of Christ. God entrusts these people, and how precious they are, and how carefully, Peter is saying, how carefully and diligently we must love them and care for them. She, the flock, is, belongs to God. It's an expression not just of possession, but of intimacy and tenderness and value. So be shepherds, he says. Be, be ready to accept responsibility. That's your responsibility. Be shepherds. To defend this precious company from the predators of evil or the predators of error. To train, to discipline in the path of moral safety. To carry the young, to heal the lame. To seek and to find the wandering. One commentator put it like this. A shepherd's job description is something like this. He or she must be a warrior and a physician. A dietitian and a midwife. A school teacher and a security guard. All of those functions are contained in the task of being shepherds of God's flock. Be ready to identify with people. Be ready to accept responsibility. Next, third thing, be rightly motivated. Be rightly motivated. And this is something, let me emphasize, that happens internally, not externally. So when I talk about, um, when I use the M word, I'm talking about being motivated. I'm not talking about being motivational. The trouble is, you know, we, we have words and they, they sometimes carry excess baggage, don't they? Like going to the airport. Or, or there, um, there was a, who's that English playwright? Oh, what was his name? Dennis Potter. He said, the trouble with words is that you never know where they've been. <laughs> and so I'm not talking about being, mo you know, I'm not talking about motivational you sometimes hear people say, I'm, oh, he so -and -so is a motivational speaker. And I don't wish to criticize anybody, but it always strikes me as being highly charged, you know, motivational speakers, what springs to my mind is someone who's highly charged, somewhat manipulative, razzmatazz, you know, almost hectoring, bullying, you know, beating you up. And I, of course, I don't mean that at all. I, I, to be perfectly honest, I've never ever tried to motivate anybody. And I suggest you copy me. If people can't be motivated by Jesus, then you and I don't stand a chance. So uh, the assumption is that people are coming towards you, your fellow leaders and other people, that you're leading, they're motivated by Jesus. That's Jesus' job, it's not ours. So, but Peter is talking here about motives for ministry. Do you understand? Are you with me? 
A clear distinction. So here's the first one. We do this ministry, we, you know, we serve as, as pastors, of, as shepherds of God's flock. We do it, first of all, because you want to rather than you have to. You want to rather than have, that's verse 2, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be. <laughs> Did you see? This is not, um, we sometimes talk about hardening of the arteries. We're not talking about hardening the arteries. You know, I ought to do this, I ought to do that. Nor are we talking, do you know what I mean by GMO? Do you know GMO? Ghastly moral obligation. <laughs> so what Peter is saying is, don't do this out of a GMO. You feel that you have some moral obligation. You see, it's a bit like giving money, isn't it? That, you know, do you remember, is it 2 Corinthians? Where Paul talks about God loves a cheerful giver. And basically his argument is, if you can't, and that word cheerful in the original New Greek language is the, we get our English word hilarious. So God loves a hilarious giver. And Paul's whole argument is, look, if you can't give hilariously, Cheerfully. If you can't do that, then don't bother giving at all. And that's certainly true of giving. I think it's true of leadership. If you can't do it joyfully and hilariously, you know, make it, and with a real sense of pleasure and fun of working with people, loving people. See, your job as a leader is to help other people do what God has called them to do your job is to help them do what God's called them to do, even better. That's my job. That's what I've spent the last... That's what we've done, isn't it? The last 20 years. Just, you know, as people... As God sent us people, or we stumbled over them, or bumped into them, the question is always, it's not how can I boss them? I'll come on to them. But it's how can, I, how can I help them do better? How can I help you do better? If I'm your leader, how can I help you do better what God has given you to do? How can I help you be more gifted? How can I help you be more holy? How can I help you be a better husband or wife? How can I help you be a better single person? How can I help you be a better employee? On it goes. That's what it's about. You see, my observation of Jesus, and for some of you, is donkey's years, like with me. For others of you, what am I? What did you say? I'm 64, 63 years and nine months I've been following Jesus. Because my mother did. So I followed her around when I was in utero. So, <laughs> do you see? Isn't that right? Logically, that's right. So, um, what all of us do is we set off to, to, you know, you're going to start a small group for the sake of argument. And what you do, you set off and you, you, you have a, you, 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 with whoever you're leading with, you have a, some sort of prayer that goes along the lines, Lord, send the people you want and help us to be a blessing to them in their lives and help them walk, get closer to Jesus. Yes, it's, that's the gist of it, right? And you, so what you then start doing is you, they, come in the, in, they come in the door and you serve them. You love them and you serve them, don't you? Hmm? You know, you feed them Jaffa cakes or maybe chocolate digestives. Uh, you love them, you ply them with coffee, you study the Bible together, you pray together, you worship together, you're serving them, you're serving them, you're serving them. What happens over a... Just think of the way when you first went to one of these groups, or when you first came to this church, and the leader served you and loved you, as I'm talking about. And then what happened? Over a course of time, you started, as they loved you, you started to be affectionate and loving towards them. A number of you have told me that you love these two. And that's exactly what I'd expect. So you, the response is you start loving your lead. And, and then you, you give them two things. You give them your love. And you give them your followership. Hmm? That's what you do. At no point did Chuck and Tara, and if I know them at all, at no point did they come to you and insist, I am your leader and you will follow me. Did any of you put up your hand? If, no, no, don't, no, because I don't want to know. <laughs> but joking apart, you, you know what I mean. 
No, none of you who lead small groups or lead one, you never went to any of your people and said, I'm going to be your leader and you're going to be my follower. <laughs> They'd run a mile if they had any sense, if you did that to them. We serve, we love their ways, that we love their ways, it's not manipulative, but we love them and serve. What you notice in response is that they give you their love and their followership. And it's a trust. And this whole thing works on trust, which is why it's so awful when leaders crash, because it's so devastating for those who have, who have trusted them. So it'd be, um, his, you, you, you want to rather than you have to. Peter says there must be no external influence, no external pressure, no arm twisting, no sense that you've been trapped into doing this and you're just cornered and painted into a corner. If you're feeling that, get out fast. No circumstance, no person must be allowed, you to, must be allowed to push you into the job. That's what my notes say. Every, every uh, office in, the, in God's army must be a volunteer. You do it willingly because you want to. Second thing, the uh, second motive is to give rather than to get. To give rather, this is verse 2, not greedy for money but eager to serve. Oh, I think I would wish to push it a little broader and just widen it out a bit because the truth is <laughs> not many of us are in this game to earn vast quantities of money. Do you know, it just doesn't... I think if you were to put it around the other way and say you're in this not what you can get out of it but what you can put into it. That's what he's really talking about. Actually, the word money doesn't appear in the original text here. You know, you occasionally come across leaders who you get the feel as what they're wanting is acclaim. They're wanting um, popularity. They're wanting fame, whatever that means. And it can be in a tiny little arena, but it's nevertheless real. Or you sometimes come across leaders who you feel are constantly wanting you to stroke them. You know, with one of our boys when he was very small and wouldn't go to Tanya and wouldn't go to sleep, he would demand pat, pat, which meant you had to sit for hours in his bedroom patting him until he went to sleep. <laughs> you know, pat, pat. Do you know, and there are some leaders like that, aren't they? You know, they preach, they preach a mediocre sermon and then you say to them on your, on your, on your way out, oh, great, you know, great, great, great sermon vicar, you know, along those lines. And they say, oh, no, it wasn't. Oh, no, it wasn't. Begging you to say, oh, yes, it was. <laughs> you know, you, you, have you ever, I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course I'm, I'm caricaturing, but you're, I mean, there are some leaders who just want you to strengthen them. They're, 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 they're so stinking insecure in themselves that they, they're wanting to get stuff out of this, and that's not how it's intended to be. It's what you put in. Yes, of course people will encourage you and congratulate you. Uh, John, am I allowed to quote John Wimber one last time? He used to say, you know, someone would, he was fine, brilliant. I mean, when he was on form, he was just electrifying when he was speaking. You know, he electrified half the congregation and electrocuted the rest. They didn't like him. <laughs> but um, when he was at his, you know, he was just, and people, he said, would people come up to him after and say, that was great. Thank you so much. Wonderful sort of talk or whatever. And he would always reply, thank you very much for saying that. I'll take the encouragement and I'll pass on the glory. It's very good. It's very good. Because, you know, sometimes you'll say, oh, that's very good. And the person will say to you, no, no, it wasn't me. It was the Lord. And you think, oh, shut up. You want to rip their head off and shout down the hole. Don't be so pious. You're a human being. Do you know? So don't do that sort of religious it makes you vomit <laughs> and you can spot the carrot uh, the last one is um, to say so, well, what are we I've just lost track what are we what have I been saying you want to rather than you have to to give rather than to get and here's the third one to lead rather than to control how are we doing for time are you looking at me yes. are you what does that mean how long, how long would you like? Excuse me, this is the Stitch and Bitch group. 
Oh, uh, you know, you're not all. Uh, whoops. No, you went all here. Some of you renegades didn't come this afternoon. Oh, heck, now I am in trouble. So, okay. For the, so, for the people, the people who were shocked by that comment, you've revealed yourself because you have displayed the fact you were not here. You skived. You cut this afternoon. You went off to swim or go to the gym or do something healthy rather than sit like a slob for another uh, workshop. What I was explaining very, very quickly, John Wimber used to travel a lot and speak a lot, and his wife would travel with him, and his sister-in-law would travel with him. And they, because they ended up listening to so many of his talks, they got bored, which is perfectly understandable. So they would sit in the front row, loyally smiling at all his jokes and listening and, 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 and knitting. And then occasionally, particularly his wife Carol, would heckle him if they got, you know, if, if, she, if she, Carol, thought he was wrong. I mean, I, uh, no, John, she'd put her hand up and say, no, John, we don't believe that. He would say, oh, don't we? No, no, well, I didn't mean that then. <laughs> you know, no, no, we don't believe that. What we believe, what, Carol, what do we believe? And then she would say, she'd come to the mic and say, this is what we believe. Oh, yes, that's what we believe. And then she'd go and sit down again, you see. So anyhow, there was this heckling. And every now and then, they would heckle him and it would irritate. So he turned to the rest of the congregation and said, that group there, they're just the stitch and bitch group. <laughs> so that's, what, uh, that's the explanation of why I was so rude to my wife just now. I was quoting. I was quoting John Wember. That's all I was doing. How about that? That sidestepped it quite neatly, didn't it? Um, anyhow, to lead rather than to control, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples for the flock. You see, what Peter is saying here, if you want to influence people, if you want to lead people and love them and serve them, then the way to do it is to be a model, to be a prototype yourself. You do it and then say to them, follow my example, rather than say to them, you know, a bit like a, a bit like a bully, you do this, never mind what I do, you do this, and you do that, and you do the other. And sometimes with congregations, we used to have a saying, the battered congregation syndrome. Because the preacher would get up, and Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, he'd get up and beat up his people. You're not this, and you're not holy enough, you're not giving enough money, and you're not evangelizing, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, you're not doing... Do you know? Well, the honest answer is if they're not evangelizing enough, if they're not giving enough, if they're not praying enough, we'd all want to say to the pastor, why don't you model it? And then we'll copy you. So you give some more money. Shut up. <laughs> you pray some more, and till then, shut up. And you lead and we'll follow. You see, that's why he says, be examples. You see that? Be examples. I'm sorry to say Yeah, being, being examples to the flock. So you want the flock to behave in a certain way. Well, you set the prototype. You do it and let them copy you. Frightening. My goodness, it's intimidating. Such a high standard for us. So if you want people to turn up on time to set up the room and to serve humbly, well guess what? You turn up on time and set up the room and serve humbly. You want people to give generously to the church? Well then you give your money generously. You want people to speak kindly about one another behind their backs? Well then you speak kindly about people behind their backs. You want people in your church to have strong marriages? If you, if you choose to get married? Well then you develop a strong marriage. Do you see? Examples of what? By definition, means something that is able to be copied mimicked. You don't do that with gifting, you do that with godly character. That's how it works, believe me. Who was I quoting the other day? A General Schwarzkopf, wasn't it? He was the man who was commanded all the Allied troops in the first Iraq war. He was the first Iraq war. Schwarzkopf, his name was, American general. And he said, as a leader, you're constantly dealing with the issues, in those you lead, you're constantly dealing with the issues of character and gifting. And that's true in the church. Constantly, all the time, is character and gifting. And he said, if you can only ever have one of those, if I could only ever have at any time one of those, I would always go for character rather than gifting. It's interesting, that's what I'm army general 
It's certainly true in the church. And sometimes we give people with great gifting more responsibility than their character can sustain. And they, God bless them, they usually crash. Because there isn't the foundation of godly character to take, you know, the, the crosswinds and the difficulties when inevitably they come. It says that in the Bible as leader. You want to be a leader? You're in for trouble. But that's another talk. So often, you know, you'll hear us as leaders talking about character as much as gifting. Being an example, leading from the front, not lording, over the, not lording it over those in trust. It's servant leadership is the phrase that we use to try and capture this sort of thinking that uh, Peter is talking about. I've got a good joke here, but I haven't got time. No, no, I haven't got time. Okay, final. I, I'm finished. I'm coming into land. I'm getting a look. No, 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 never mind. Never mind. No, no, really, no, we really have. You're quite right. We really are running out of time. So here, okay, why do we... Okay, bottom line, I'm, I'm coming into land now. I'm in like an aircraft, finals to land. I can see the, I can see the uh, runway right there ahead of me. And believe me, when I say finally, I mean finally, unlike some other people here. <laughs> why do we do all this, Peter says? Why put up with all the flack and all the investment of time and energy and money, blood, toil, sweat and tears? Why do we do it? Look in verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears, the, the arch, not an archbishop, but an arch shepherd, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fail away, fade away. So Peter is basically saying, once the battle is over, is over and done with, there are medals to be won. There are awards to be dished out. Forget Oscars. Forget the Victoria Cross. Forget the Medal of Honor. They're nothing. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that will never fade. For all of you who are leading, one day, Peter says here, the Holy Spirit says through Peter, you will receive a crown of glory that will never fade away. It's a genuine invaluable reward awaiting you and me for faithful service. That's why we do it. Because we love people and because of the reward. Hmm? Let's pray. Amen.